Uh, hi class, how are you? Um, so today we're going to cover cellular junctions and the extracellular matrix. Um, and there's uh, quite a bit to know here, but it's pretty simple. Uh, there's just some major players that you'll, you'll sort of have to focus on. Um, and what really makes it important is that <clears throat> Cells in multicellular organisms like ourselves, they're all held together, right? Um, and they're held together in such a way that, you know, allows tish specific tissue formation and other things. And, and we're really sort of a highly organized collection of cells. And so how all of our cells are connected um, is really sort of important. And if you want to think where this really comes uh, into play and where it's important, it comes in with sort of metastatic uh, cancers, the ones that have sort of spread to different parts of your body. So if a cell uh, isn't kept in its right position, um, it can leak out, like a cancer cell, if it uh, isn't held in place, it can leak out and then spread to other parts of the body. Okay, um, and so in the case with just cells and multicellular organisms, all of our cells are sort of combined and, and they play supportive and antagonistic functions, right? Um, and sort of that's what happens when the cells are held together. Um, and if you stop and think when we were going over phospholipids, uh, you know, each phospholipid has a polar head group on it. Um, and they don't really like to self-associate, right? Um, and so there's proteins uh, that sort of help the self-association. Um, and those cells are also attached to an extracellular matrix, and that gives the cells sort of a substrate with which to bind. Um, and today we're going to cover sort of all of the numerous types of cell-cell adhesions and how they happen. And it's a pretty conserved mechanism um, overall, uh, largely involving just a, a one single family of proteins called the cadherins, which we'll learn about in a second. Um, so here's just an overview of um, an epithelial layer uh, where you can see the cells and they're all sort of attached uh, to one another. Um, we'll cover what these black things are right here, but then they're connected via intermediate filaments and through the cytoskeleton. Um, and this allows c cells to have some mechanical strex, right? So, you know, our skin cells, when they die, they sort of fall off, but in general, you know, our, all of our skin cells are sort of connected together. Um, and it's these cell-cell junctions um, and their attachment here to the extracellular matrix um, that really sort of give everything its structure, okay? Um, so there's sort of four main types of physical attachments, um, and then some of them are broken down into, into subgroups, um, but you have your anchoring junctions. These sort of hold cells uh, to each other and to um, the extracellular matrix. Um, in epithelial cells, like in our intestinal lumen, uh, we, act, we have these occluding junctions as well, which help to keep uh, certain liquids on one side um, versus on the other. Uh, there's also channel forming junctions uh, that allow free passage of ions and other things through them. Um, and then there's signal relaying junctions. And here you can sort of think of it, this is a, a synapse, but also you can have immunological synapses. And so anytime two cells are gonna come together um, and signal to one another, they'll probably form one of these signal relaying junctions. Um, so here's just some functional classifications of the different um, sort of junctions. There's ones that are attached to actin. So in general, these uh, connections are oftentimes attached to uh, cytoskeletal filaments, mainly actin filaments and intermediate filaments. Um, and so the actin filament uh, junctions can occur cell to cell um, or they can occur cell to matrix. Um, and if they're occurring cell to cell, they're in a, called an adherence junction. Uh, whereas the cell matrix, they're an a, um, actin link cell matrix adhesion. Um, if you're attached to an intermediate filament, uh, they're called the desmosomes if they're cell-cell uh, junctions, or if they're cell to extracellular matrix, they're called hemidesmosomes. 
Um, you then have your occluding junctions, which are called tight junction invertebrates, septate junctions in invertebrates, um, and then you have your channel forming junctions um, in animals, and then you have your sort of signal relay, signal relaying junctions, which are the chemical synapses, immunological synapses, and also sort of cell-cell receptor, receptor mediated signaling that, that can occur, okay? Um, <clears throat> So there's a, actually a hierarchy of these in the cell. The tight junctions, if you're sort of in an epithelial layer, the tight junctions always sort of sit on top, the, the occluding junctions. Um, and then right under them are the adherence junctions. These are the ones with actin, and you can see the actin, um, it's sort of color-coded red here. Um, and then you have your desmosomes, which are sort of attached to the intermediate filaments. Um, and then under that is the gap junctions. Um, and the sort of cell anchoring junctions uh, that are down here can also be actin, or you can have the um, hemidesmosomes uh, sort of connected to the extracellular matrix um, as well. Um, so once again, these are hierarchical. You'll, we'll see um, some images uh, in the second part of the lecture today on, on sort of how you can see those. Um, so the way this connections work is it's this uh, family of proteins called the cadherins, and they're the sort of the super family, and these sort of uh, uh, form these cell-cell um, connections here. Um, and then uh, the ones that connect to the extracellular matrix um, are called uh, integrins. Um, okay, and then they're both attached to sort of cytoskeletal filaments depending on how they are. Um, but the cadherins is, re is really the, the sort of the super family um, of proteins that we're going to look at uh, right now. Um, so once again, there's two main types, the adherins um, in the cell to cell. There's two main types. There's the adherins junctions and then the desmosomes. Um, and once the transmembrane protein that's involved in the uh, adhesion are the cadherins. Um, they have different names if it's a desmosome. Um, and different ones if it's um, an adherin. Um, but by and large, that's what's holding them together. Um, and then they're connected in to the intercellular filaments uh, and the anchor proteins like actin um, and other things like that. So um, once again, not you don't really have to memorize all of these, but I do want you to appreciate that the cadherins um, are really the, the proteins that are mediating this. Um, and then when you're at the cell matrix, it's the integrins. Um, now, the cadherins, when they're sort of uh, being expressed and during embryogenesis, they can have either tight or strong they can have either weak or strong associations, and we'll see what some schematics of this. But you know, early on, uh, when you have an embryo, just a couple will be expressed. But then, as the embryo starts to develop into sort of a multicellular uh, structure, these uh, the connections actually get stronger. And and one of the ways they get stronger is the cells just produce more and more of them. Um, uh, they're also sort of tissue specific uh, in where they are, so they're very cell type specific is uh, more the, the, the way it should be said because you can have different um, cadherins even in sort of one sort of organ. So this happens to be um, a schematic of a developing rodent brain, uh, and you can see here that, you know, here you have E cadherin, here is R cadherin, um, and then there's uh, cadherin 6 here. And so depending on the cells, the, they'll express different cadherins, and that's what actually sort of holds them together um, and sort of causes like cells to co-localize so that they can accomplish a specific function. Um, there's really hundreds of cadherin family members. There's 50 alone in the brain, um, so the, the numbers of them are actually quite uh, distinct. Um, so here's just a nice schematic of all of the different uh, cadherins. E cadherin sort of the classical one that everybody looks at, but then there's a whole bunch of um, other ones. Flamingo is sort of a famous one that was found in flies um, and is involved in uh, wind signaling. Um, and so, but they have this sort of cadherin domain here um, that they all sort of share. 
and, and we'll see how that Ketheron domain functions in, in a second here. Um, but here's just uh, some of the uh, Ketherons, the classical ones. Um, here are the non-classical ones. Uh, these ones right here, uh, Desmocolin and um, Desmoglein um, are actually in desmosomes, whereas the cad strict cadherins are sort of in the adherence junction. So the adherence will be actin linked, and these will be intermediate filament linked oftentimes. Um, now you can have two types of connections between two cells. You can have um, homophilic binding or heterophilic binding. Um, and if it's two like cadherins attaching, then you have homophilic. Uh, if it's two separate um, connecting proteins, then it's uh, hetero heterophilic. Um, and these are all typically low affinity binding, so oftentimes a cell will have many of them to, to sort of force the um, stronger connections. Um, here's just a nice schematic of how the cadherins look. If you go back and we look at those uh, domains here, um, right here, uh, each one of these is just a, a simple little fold here, um, and then they connect. Um, and here's sort of a blow up of the connection. And they sort of fit together like a lock and key um, and one of the things that regulates their attachment is calcium. So if calcium is present, they sort of stick out. Uh, when calcium's not present, um, they, they become much more flexible and sort of just flop around. Okay, so usually the binding's associated with calcium. And this goes back to what we've sort of been looking at where, you know, the regulating the amount of calcium extracellularly um, and intracellularly uh, is important for, you know, a lot of different functions, um, but here's one where it's involved in sort of cell attachment. Um, and once again, uh, calcium can affect uh, the sort of flexibility of the cadherin, so if there's plenty of calcium around, it's a nice sort of straight rigid structure, whereas if you remove the calcium, the, the cadherin can just sort of flop around. Okay, so, and that helps, uh, let's say a cell wants to migrate somewhere, you can actually uh, sort of loosen it up and let it go where it needs to by sort of removing the calcium that's present. Um, if you sort of look at it in sort of multiple attachments here, you can sort of see that, and almost sort of think about it as molecular Velcro, right? Many of those connections are coming together. And the more connections that you have, the sort of the harder it is to separate them. And these also are sort of involved in sort of making sure that certain cells are self-associating um, because you can sort of regulate how many of these cadherins are actually on the surface. Um, and here's what I mean by that. So the, the homophilic um, cadherin attachments, they can sort of facilitate like uh, sort of attachments or like cell attachments. So here you just have a, a sort of a mass of cells and each one is sort of color coded here to represent how much of the specific cadherins um, and if they're mixed, they'll, they'll, the cadherins will actually pull themselves together um, and sort of form an ultrastructure and sort of self-organize. Okay, so you can have a random mixture, so a random mixture to start off, but then they'll sort of self-assemble based on the cadherins that are expressed on the surface. Um, they're also very important um, in development, and we'll see this over the next couple of slides. Okay, so in sort of the neural crest uh, development, what you end up having is uh, stuff with the cadherin homophilic binding. Okay, so cells that'll become the neural crest actually come off of this uh, sort of neural tube here, and then you'll have your neural crest cells and they'll start to migrate down, um, and then they'll eventually aggregate based on their cadherin expression and then they'll start to differentiate and then you'll have your nerve cells and your peripheral peripheral gang ganglia and things like that. All right, so this sort of happens in development and we'll see how this sort of neural uh, sort of tube here forms in just a second because that also involves um, the cadherins and uh, sort of the um, adherins. 
So here's just an image of the uh, sort of neural tube uh, forming here. Um, and you can see the different cadherin expressions. So here in panel A is E cadherin, um, whereas down here in B it's, it's N cadherin. And so to sort of get this to form, they'll start to express different ones and that causes sort of like cells to uh, self-associate. Um, here's sort of a schematic of how it happens. You have your um, ectoderm and the, the different cadherins are color-coded here. So here in the ectoderm, you're mostly having E, um, and then uh, all of a sudden when the neural tube starts to form, this has a lot of N cadherin, whereas there's a little bit of the cadherin 6B, um, and then all of a sudden, uh, different cadherin will start to be expressed and it sort of the cells start to migrate down to where you have the neural sort of crest cells forming here. So once again, all you have to do is sort of, if a cell wants to develop and move and, and to a right location, it can change its expression of the, the cadherins. Um, and once again, they can sort of self-sort. So you can take a population of cells expressing different types of cadherins, either uh, e cadherin shown here in blue or red the n cadherin and you get these collection of cells and they'll sort out so that the all the ones containing the n cadherin are separated from the ones expressing um, the e cadherin um, and also the expression levels of the cadherins themselves if it's the same cadherin will uh, will actually sort of sort out so here you have um, sort of low level expression sort of goes on the outside and the ones that have high levels of expression will be packaged and, and, uh, and much more tightly together. Um, so the cadherins are actually can be linked to either intermediate filaments and or actin but in general the cadherin family um, is connected via actin um, and these are at the uh, adherins junctions um, and so in this case, this cadherin is a, connected to the catenin family of proteins, beta catenin and P120 catenins. Then there's some other anchoring proteins. Um, and beta catenin um, is also involved in Wnt signaling. So if we go back to Flamingo, which I mentioned, that's uh, actually involved in Wnt signaling as well. Um, you guys don't really have to know that um, because we don't, I don't really get uh, specifically into wind signaling, but in the case with some of the graduate students, this is one of these topics that uh, you're likely to come across at some point in your graduate career. Um, and that goes for all the undergrads who are going to graduate school too. Um, okay, so in this connection right here where you have the cadherins linked to actin, um, also with the, the catenins here, um, you get these things where you get the sort of the adhesion belt. Okay, so the actin is l ultimately linked to the cadherins, and the uh, cadherins are linked to one another. Um, and so what you get is this belt where you have these actin filaments connected to the cadherins that then self-associate. Um, and this helps sort of really keep an epithelial uh, layer of cells together and in sort of a uh, somewhat uh, rigid uh, form that prevents any sort of leakage um, from, and, and once again, there's the hierarchy where you have the tight junctions and then you have your adherent junctions and then under those would be the, the desmosomes um, and then your channel forming junctions would be down here. Um, and the actin and the uh, sort of between the adherents is actually involved in sort of creating that neural tube that we just looked at here. It's called, they, they're calling it an epithelial tube, but you can have a, a sheet of epithelial layers and all of a sudden the adhesion belt will start to tighten um, and you get an invagination um, and eventually it'll pinch off um, and sort of form this epithelial tube, right? And we saw this with the ectoderm um, and the neural tube uh, just in a few things, and then the neural crest cells will start to come off of here. All right, so um, these sort of adherent attachments can actually be involved in this sort of uh, epithelial tube formation. Um, okay, so right under the adherents, uh, you have the desmosomes, um, and they're very similar. They're a cadherin family of proteins. 
um, and then you have sort of your dense plaque of anchoring proteins that are here. Um, and then these, instead of being connected to actin, they're, they're connected to intermediate filaments. Okay, um, and these also help give the epithelial cells some mechanical strength. Um, now here's the components of the desmosome. Um, you don't have to memorize these, just remember that there's uh, some cadherin family members, um, desmocolin and, and desmoglein, um, and then there's a couple of uh, uh, desmoplankin and planktoglobin and planktophilin that are over here connected to the intermediate filaments. Um, but just remember that the desmosomes very similar to the adherins, um, just the, the proteins are a little bit different. Um, and these are, once again, cadherin family members, so d the name is a little less important than just knowing that there is that hierarchy where you have um, the, the tight junctions, the adherin junctions, and then the desmosomes underneath them. Um, and that they're all sort of aligned separately, except in the case with the adherins, they're actin-linked, and the desmosomes are, are linked to intermediate filaments. Here's a great EM of the desmosomes right here. You can sort of see them uh, all sort of connected. Um, and if you sort of blow that up, uh, you can sort of see um, how tightly they're connected here with all of the cadherin family members that are associated. And then you have the, the sort of underlying um, matrix proteins and then the intermediate filaments are connected to them. Um, and here they are again, uh, once again the desmosomes, you have your tight junction and then you have your adherins would normally be up here. Um, these are all connected to intermediate filaments like keratin. Remember keratin and how abundant it was um, in the skin? Well, you know, here it is right here. Um, and then these connect to hemidesmosomes, which are then connected to the extracellular matrix. Um, Flemagus is actually an autoimmune disease uh, where your body actually makes antibodies against one of the cadherins, um, and it sort of causes uh, blistering and things like that. So, um, where your body is actually attacking these uh, right under your skin. Um, now, the other thing that uh, cells use for attachment are selectins, um, or just the larger family, they have a lectin domain here, um, an EGF-like domain, and, and this is P-selectin, um, and they're connected to anchoring proteins, which are also connected to actin. Um, and there's uh, three types, the, the P, the L, and the E, um, and the selectins are heterophilic. They'll, they'll actually bind to different proteins. They're not sort of homophilic like the cadherins are. Um, and the selectin binding is, is relatively weak. Um, and believe it or not, we've seen the selectins in action um, on the first day of class because when you had that rolling leukocyte that was going through in the, in the Harvard animation video, it was actually the selectin-dependent binding as it was rolling along. And then when it got that signal to actually sort of do its transmigration uh, through the, out of the blood vessel, what you end up getting integrin-dependent um, attachment, and then it starts to crawl in the lamellipodia um, form, and it can sort of squeeze through and into the tissue, right? So this is what white blood cells do when they need to sort of migrate to an area of infection. Um, and some of the things that they bind to, uh, the integrins anyway, are these uh, Ig superfamilies that are on the cells, um, NCAM uh, and ICAM, and these have IgG or, or Ig-like domains, so immunoglobulin domains that contain disulfides, um, and there's also fibronectin uh, type 3 domains on these, um, and they're sort of expressed in the vasculature, and they're recognized by white blood cells um, and the integrins when it's time for them to sort of undergo this sort of transmigration that you, that's sort of drawn out here in this schematic. Um, in your sort of cell-cell junctions, your signaling junctions, what you have are scaffold proteins that sort of hold everything together, and then you have your cadherin-like family. This is called neuroligin that's sort of attaching, and then um, we've sort of seen these uh, voltage-gated channels last time, as well as the ligand-gated um, receptors, the glutamate receptors, um, and they're anchored by this protein uh, 
called PSD95, um, and there's uh, have little PDZ binding domains that sort of hold them uh, on the cell surface. Okay, so these adhesion molecule molecules are actually really important for synapse formation, um, it, so that you know the sort of the axon uh, termini can actually be in proper orientation with the dendrite. Um, and you have your sort of presynaptic membrane and your postsynaptic membrane. Um, and we saw this last time where you have the vesicles that can fuse here. Um, but you can sort of see here that this little signaling junction is formed. Okay. Um, and here's sort of a schematic of the signaling junction. You're going to have your cadherin family and your Ig super family members that hold things together. You'll have your scaffold underneath it. Um, this is PSD95. Um, and then you can have your neuroligin and um, norexin sort of forming that uh, heterophilic binding. Um, and it just sort of gives everything sort of localized so that when the synaptic vesicles fuse and the neurotransmitters released, it can find its appropriate sort of neurotransmitter receptor. Um, and then also the sort of ion channels um, are organized. Uh, here as well. Okay, so it's all just anchored in place for really efficient um, signaling. Um, and this is pretty simplified, but I think you guys get the idea. It's, pr it's much more complex than this, and there's many, many uh, more channels and, and receptors in a given synapse. Okay, so that's it for um, the first half. Uh, in the next half, we'll, we'll look at the extracellular matrix um, and some of the gap junctions um, as well as the uh, tight junctions. Okay.